All right, well, I'm not used to talking into a microphone, but this is good. Um, so my name is Paul Whitaker. I teach biology here. Uh, I think I'm in my 21st year. That's old, right? Um, and, and this, preparing for this presentation has been really fun. I've really enjoyed it. Um, my PhD from UW-Madison was in entomology, which is insect biology. And I did my um, PhD research on insect communities in an organic apple orchard in southwest Wisconsin. So, um, and then I got hired here before I actually finished my dissertation. And I got excited about all kinds of things going on here. So my PhD languished until finally they said, you better finish that or you lose your job. So I, I hurried up and I finished. Uh, and then my wife got me um, as a graduation present five years after I started this job, uh, hand crank cider press. And so we, um, we, we have four acres of land on the edge of town and I have, uh, when we moved in there were two bearing apple trees and I planted about four more that year and I've gradually been accumulating other apple trees. Some die and I take them out and, I, um, and I've been grafting trees and uh, I actually have five sitting in gallon pots in my garage overwintering that I have to find a place for in the springtime. And the trick is protecting them from the deer. So, uh, so I've sort of had a, an amateur's interest in apples and cider and, and apple juice and all things apple, especially coming at it from a gardener's perspective and a cook's perspective um, and then a biologist's perspective as well. So I'm going to take you on a wild tour of apples today and give you some, um, some more appreciation for what many people consider the all-American fruit, which it totally is not. <laughs> so. Um, so I'll, I'll talk in a little bit about the Geneva Apple Collection, which is in Geneva, Unor Geneva Unor bleh, New York, New York, um, which is affiliated with Cornell University and the USDA. But uh, they are a repository, probably the world's largest repository of different varieties of apple trees. And they have a big orchard with two of each kind of apple tree. Um, any apple that you can think of that has a name is there in duplicate and many, many apples that are just known by a number or a code are there as well. And this basket shows um, a collection of some of the apples at harvest, and you can see a whole variety of colors and shapes. Uh, apples are an amazingly, uh, the biological term is heterozygous, which means genetically variable, which means if you have the same two parents, they can produce an extraordinary, extraordinarily different, no, extraordinarily high number of different offspring. And that's, uh, that's kind of gonna be a theme throughout what I'll talk about today. So the picture on the left, uh, one of the things that I've done for, oh, I think I'm moving on eight years now is I, I grow some potatoes in my vegetable garden um, as part of uh, a series of variety trials trying to figure out um, what varieties of potatoes grow best under organic production practices. This is through the horticulture department and formerly the plant pathology department at UW-Madison. Um, and, and so I grow 10 of each kind of potato and then evaluate how they're doing with insects and diseases and how they yield and um, how they grow and, and that report that kind of information. Um, because most of the research on potatoes has been done with conventional high chemical, high pesticide, uh, high irrigation types of farming practices. And with the growth of organics, they're interested in how things do under organic circumstances. About, uh, and, and potatoes, for example, you might be familiar with the russet Burbank potato. That was bred back in the mid 1800s by Luther Burbank. And it is essentially a genetic clone of that potato that he bred back in the 1800s. So every russet Burbank potato is essentially a genetic clone. You take cuttings and you you know, you save them over winter and you put them in the ground and you get a clone of the plant that you had the year before. And that goes all the way back to the time when, when that potato was bred. So about six years ago, I had the opportunity to do um, an interesting experiment, part of breeding new varieties of potatoes. And I was sent a little plastic vial with about, half a, about a dozen seeds of a particular cross that a potato grower had done. And potatoes actually do produce fruit that produce actual seed. They look a lot like tomato seeds, but they're smaller. And so I planted those 12 seeds. They were seeds taken out of one tomato berry. And I started them indoors, and I raised them under lights. And then when they were big enough, I transplanted them out to the garden. And the picture that you see on the left is eight of the surviving offspring of that one cross. 
So the same pollen parent and the same female receptive parent, the same berry, those 10 plants produced wildly different numbers of potatoes with different flesh colors and different skin colors and different shapes, different susceptibilities to diseases. So that, that was really the first time that I saw firsthand with my own hand experience the, the biological meaning of something that I've taught for a long time, which is that the biological purpose of sex is genetic variability. It's not all about fun. <laughs> Although this was really fun <laughs> as a biologist. So, so that was pretty cool. The picture on the right um, is a picture of the same sort of thing from apples. So those are five apples that grew on five different trees that grew from five seeds from the same apple. So if you like Honeycrisp apples and you think, oh, I have one, I'll take those seeds out and I'll plant those in my garden, you're gonna get five or eight or 10 different apple trees, all of which will have Honeycrisp as a parent, but will not be Honeycrisp apple trees. So have different sizes, different flavors, different shapes. The trees themselves will have different sizes and shapes, different susceptibilities to insects and diseases. So that's what plant breeders have to deal with is that genetic variability that arises. And unlike some things, if you grow tomatoes, for example, you can be pretty confident if you save seeds from a brandywine tomato that you're gonna get brandywine tomatoes from that, barring any cross-pollination. But with apples, that's not true. And in fact, it can be really difficult for apples to produce fruit if there's not a different, genetically different tree to provide pollen for that, for that tree. So apples require, in large part, require cross-pollination. They require a pollen contribution from a genetically different tree. Now, if you live near a city or if you live here in Wisconsin, that's not usually a problem because bees can travel two to three miles from their hive as they're doing pollination. And we've got lots of wild apple trees. And in fact, ornamental crab apples will serve as a pollen parent for apple trees. So in fact, if you were to save seeds from a backyard apple tree, its parents might be a little hard, bitter, astringent, barely edible crab apple and that delicious apple that you have in your yard. And so then if you were to plant that seed and let that tree grow up and harvest fruit from it, who knows what you're gonna get. Right. So when we think about good apples, and by good apples, I mean ones that people would want to grow, would want to eat, there's really three main ways that those can come about. And one is wild trees. Turns out that Red Delicious was a wild apple tree that was discovered in Iowa. And a farmer discovered it and thought, hey, this is a pretty delicious apple. And he showed it to the owner of Starks Brothers Nursery, who paid them, I think, $1,000 or $2,000 for the rights to that apple and, and have grown it ever since. Um, so wild seedlings can be a source of apple varieties. And, and Granny Smith was discovered as a wild apple tree growing along a riverbank in Australia. So it was not the product of breeding. Uh, Things like Honeycrisp, on the other hand, and Fuji and um, Zestar and some other apples are the product of deliberate breeding. So people have done apple breeding for um, probably, I don't know when it actually started, but you know it might go back to the Roman days when people uh, had apple trees and like, oh, this one's good and this one's good. It might not have been intentional, but they collected seeds and planted them. But there have been apple breeding programs in the United States for quite some time. Unfortunately, we're, we're down to only one in the United States, one full-time apple breeder out of all of the land-grant universities in the country. There's one full-time apple breeder. Others dabble in it, but there's only one full-time apple breeder, and she's in New York at Cornell. So apple sex is responsible for those wild trees. It's also part of breeding. And then the third way that apples can come about, and so you may have said, oh, Red Delicious. How many think Red Delicious is delicious? Yeah, right, okay. So it turns out that it probably used to be quite delicious. And what's happened over time, because people are people, when you go to the grocery store and you buy oranges, and they're not packed in a bag, but they're loose, are you gonna choose the one that's got some greenish parts on it, or are you gonna choose the one that's entirely orange? You're gonna choose the orange one, right? If you're there and you're picking apples out of a bin and they're supposed to be red apples, are you gonna pick the all red ones or are you gonna pick the ones that have a little bit of greenish or yellowish on them? People are attracted to that bright red color. And so over the decades that, uh, actually 
century and decades that Red Delicious has been around, there have been what are called sports or mutations on branches where somebody noticed I've got a delicious apple tree and that branch has apples that are noticeably redder than the rest of the tree. And they can propagate those. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that there's an inverse correlation in some apple varieties of redness and flavor. So the redder you get, the less delicious you get. Ha. We're our own worst enemy sometimes. All right, so here's a picture of a flower just to illustrate plant sex for you. And as I mentioned, apples have a very high heterozygosity. And what that means is the opposite of inbred, right? So if, if something is highly inbred, like German shepherds, you cross a German shepherd with a German shepherd and you get a whole litter of German shepherd puppies. If you cross a poodle, which is highly inbred because poodle cross poodle cross poodle cross poodle over the generations, you got pure poodle, and you cross that with a pure Labrador, you get a Labradoodle. And you get a different set of traits, and all of those puppies might look a little bit different because the genetic deck gets shuffled a little bit each way. And then if you save that Labradoodle, and maybe you cross it with another Labradoodle, then you introduce even more genetic variability, right? So every generation you go. So apples are like that pound puppy where there's been generation after generation after generation of dogs having sex out in the alley somewhere and having puppies and the puppies grow up and they mate with each other and you get this very genetically variable mix. Apples are even more genetically variable than that. And part of it is because you could have a brother and sister dog from a litter, so they share the same two parents, and they could have sex and have the next generation of puppies, right? So that would be like the same family. It gets a little bit different with plants because a flower like an apple flower has both female and male in the same flower, right? That's not possible for dogs. A dog can't fertilize itself and get pregnant, right? But plants, many plants can do that. They can pollinate themselves and, and then that circumvents the genetic variability. And it turns out that apples' requirement for pollen from a genetically different pollen source, meaning a different variety of apple or a different crab apple or something, means that apple is much more genetically variable than many, many other organisms. In fact, humans are about on the same scale of genetic variability as apples are. And so if you think about, you know, if you've got five kids, how different all of those kids are in terms of sex and temperament and hair color and height and aptitudes and interests, you know, some of that's how they were raised and things that happened to them over their lifetime, but a lot of that is genetic, and that's that genetic variability. So apples, if you think about apples in the wild, those wild apple trees that I was talking about, um, Cross-pollination is required, fruit is set, animals eat the fruit, they wander around and they poop out the seeds and that seed finds a favorable place and it grows up into a new apple tree with different apples and then it cross-pollinates. So you get this long lifespan and that apple tree in the wild, it might live for 50 years or 100 years. I think the oldest known apple tree might be 300 years. So every single year, every single flower on that tree that gets pollinated and makes a fruit with seeds in it that's a whole lot of genetic variability from that one parent, assuming that those apples get dispersed and their seeds germinate and you get those, um, those fruits and those trees growing. So that's the self-incompatibility bit. And that long lifespan means you can have lots of offspring traveling ac across the landscape in the bellies of animals getting pooped out and finding new places to grow. And then when humans get involved, we say, oh, that's a good tree. I'm gonna keep that one, or I inherited some land and it had 15 apple trees on it, but those five are just ta nasty tasting. I'm gonna cut those down. I'm gonna keep these ones. That changes the genetic variability as well. Because now it's not natural selection that's selecting for those trees, it's human selection. It's our preferences. So what that means in a nutshell is, not in a nutshell, that's terrible. In the core of an apple is that every seed is genetically different. Okay, so whether it be wild plant sex giving us wild apple varieties, some of which we like and some of which we don't, or intentional plant breeding through a research project or a breeding project, every seed in every apple is genetically different. So it turns out uh, a really interesting Russian geneticist by the name of Vavilov was, um, he's sort of the founder of discovering the origins of domesticated crop plants. 
So where did wheat come from? The Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. Where did corn come from? The highlands of central Mexico. Um, he discovered that uh, there were these just amazingly diverse forests of apple trees growing in what's, um, what's now known as Kazakhstan, used to be part of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's the country right there in the middle of the slide. Um, north of the Himalayan mountains, across, uh, across a desert, there's a range of mountains there called the Tian Shan, or the Heavenly Mountains. Beautiful, beautiful area. Apparently has never been subject to glaciation. And apples have lived there for a really long time throughout the repeated ice ages that have covered most of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, for whatever reason, partly it might be the monsoon climates, the warm, wet climate coming up across the Indian Ocean, across the Indian subcontinent, and then keeping that area somewhat warm. So there are forests there where 80% of the trees are apple trees. And they've lived there for many, 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 many years, millennia. And so with all of that long lifespan and inbreeding, or um, outcrossing and incompatibility, there's an incredible variety of apples there. Um, unfortunately, Kazakhstan has oil and has natural gas. And as part of the dissolution of the, uh, the Soviet Union, um, that country has experienced an economic boom, and a lot of those wild apple forests are being cut down for building houses. So there's been incredible deforestation of this incredible genetic resource of apples in the Tian Shan Mountains of Kazakhstan. So I mentioned the Geneva Apple Collection. Um, they have researchers from there and other places in the United States have made a number of trips to Kazakhstan and collected germplasm, apples with seeds in them, and brought them back. So probably. 1,500 to 2,000 of the varieties of apples growing in the Geneva Apple Collection are from that uh, offspring of that wild collection in Kazakhstan. Um, it's really depressing to read about that. I was really excited when I first learned about it, like, oh, I want to go there. That's on my bucket list. And then to find out that it's disappearing. And I'll show you some pictures of what that forest looks like a little bit later on. So in any case, if you, if you take a look at that, you can see that that dashed line on the graph or those grash, dashed lines are the Silk Road. Right? the trading routes between China and the, um, and the Mediterranean region, Egypt and Rome, Italy and Europe. And so uh, one of the things that's thought to have happened in the Tian Shan Mountains is that bears, they have what we know as grizzly bear, it's known as the brown bear, and bears are omnivores, they like apples. And like us, we'd rather bite into a big apple than a small one and so they think that there has been selection by bears for good tasting sweet apples that are large in these forests. So unlike uh, the wild trees of Wisconsin, the wild apple trees of Wisconsin, many more of the apple trees in the Tian Shan produce really delicious, edible, and reasonably large sized fruit. And that would attract the attention not only of the bears that were eating the fruit and pooping out the seeds, but probably not wandering long distances, but the human caravans, trade caravans, going from the Tian Shan into China, and then also from the Tian Shan and China all the way out to Europe. And so there's this corridor of apples. And there are species of apples in the Caucasus Mountains of Turkey, and then um, Egyptian pharaohs, uh, there are Egyptian hieroglyphs and records of apples growing in Egypt, and then the Romans definitely got involved with apples as well. So, uh, so that's sort of the origin of what's known as Malus Domestica, and one of the sources that I read in preparation for this, um, Malus Domestica, Malus is the genus of apples and crab apples, and Domestica means it's the domestic variety, the domestic species. Um, one of the sources that I read said, you know, you know what? The Brayburn apples and the Honeycrisp apples and the delicious apples that we have really are just that same species, just selected varieties. And so they call it Malus pomala, which was the very first name of apples. So there's a bit of dispute on what to actually call apples in terms of their scientific name. But, so that's kind of interesting. So that's where a lot of that wild sex happened. Um, one of the things that duped me, and I, I mentioned in my um, morning presentation on climate change, rabbit holes, and you can follow down a lot of rabbit holes when you investigate uh, some new topic for the first time. And so I fell for the bait. There was a book that I found in the library called Apples are from Kazakhstan, and 
I knew that that was true. And so I ordered the book, and it, it's written by a British author. Uh, and other than the author's initial interest in Kazakhstan, he had never heard of it before, and it was talking to uh, a guy from uh, the mid middle United States with a southern drawl on an airplane flight, and he was on his way to Russia to meet his Russian bride that he met through the internet. And, um, and one of his parting comments was, and his bride was from Kazakhstan, and he said, did you know that apples are from Kazakhstan? And he said, I didn't know that. And so then he was like, Kazakhstan, where is that? I don't know anything about it. And it's a huge country, and so he wound up going there and uh, meeting people and living there for a while. And the book is all about the history and the culture of Kazakhstan, and there's nothing at all about, almost nothing at all about apples in that book. <laughs> but it was really interesting, so I kept reading it. Um, and, and one of the things that, if, if you're an environmentalist, you may know about the tragedy of the Aral Sea. And you can see that on the uh, left center of the, the map there, just above where it says Turin Lowland. The Aral Sea was a huge freshwater lake um, that due to Soviet mismanagement and the idea of be, turning that surrounding desert into a cotton gold mine, uh, they sucked almost all of the water out of the lake for irrigation projects. Um, pesticides and fertilizers drained into what was left, and the lake has virtually disappeared. So an incredibly large lake. And part of the book, uh, the author, Christopher Robbins, goes out with the president of the country to take a tour of what used to be that. They had fisheries, they had trawlers, canneries, and all of that is completely gone because of the, um, the way the Soviets mismanaged that lake. So that's kind of interesting in addition to the apples. Isn't it being replenished by water they have, they have redirected some water into it, and the northern, uh, what, what looks like two little northern parts are replenishing, but the southern part is, is virtually gone. Yeah, the desert around there, the desert just... Yep, yep, yep. And because it's desert, when they take that fresh water out and they irrigate and the water evaporates, it leaves salts behind. So now the, it's like a salty desert, and the salt and the dust blow around, and yeah. It's a really bad place. So it was interesting to read about that. The other thing that's interesting is that the capital of, of Kazakhstan is right on the border of, with China. And let's see, there we go. I always have a hard time. I'm a little bit colorblind. And so when I, people use laser pointers, it takes me uh, forever to find the dot. And so anyways, there's the Tian Shan and, the, and what used to be the capital is Almaty. It was right there on the border with China. And as China is growing, um, I think the story is the Kazakh president was kind of concerned about if China continues to grow and they decided to push over the boundary that Almaty might not be the best place for a capital. So they built an entirely brand new capital city in the middle of the country, starting from a, a little village that was like 15,000 people, and now it's over a million people. They've got this huge, they call it the Pleasure Dome. It's this big indoor place with a wave pool and beaches. They actually imported sand from somewhere, and there's a shopping mall, and it's all like new, interesting architecture. It's like, wow, this is kind of an interesting country. So, so maybe I'll go there, but not to see the apple forests if they're all gone. All right, so wild apples also in the United States. And Johnny Appleseed has long been seen as this purveyor of, uh, of goodness and wholesomeness, and apples, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And it turns out that he was really a purveyor of apple trees that were wild, most of which were inedible and sour and tart and bitter, but you could still juice them and let that juice ferment because nobody had refrigeration or freezing, and it would turn into hard cider. So forget about the Walt Disney version of Johnny Appleseed. If you go online, you can find, oh, the Lord is good to me. And so, right, for giving me the sun and rain, the sun and rain, the apple seed. So, uh, yep, nope, Johnny Appleseed, he was, a, he was an interesting guy. He, per, um, he, he followed a religion uh, developed by a Swedish guy named Swedenborgian, Swedenborg, Swedenborg. And it, and it was an interesting religion where uh, the natural world and the spiritual world were one and the same. And so every element of the natural world also had a spiritual component and was sort of sentient. And, uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit later on about grafting of apple trees, which is where you cut into a branch or a stem and you splice in another piece of, of apple wood of the kind that you want and you let that wound heal. And then that's how we get orchards full of Honeycrisp apples, for example, right? We don't get them from seed. We got the original one from seed, but how do we get an orchard full of those? It's through grafting. 
And Johnny Appleseed knew about that, but he felt like that was causing harm to the trees. It damaged them, it injured them, it wounded them. And in fact, it would be a human attempt to improve on God's creation, and so grafting was a no-no growing apples from seed. And, and, and there's some thought that he also saw that this was a way to Americanize the apple. When Europeans came across as settlers, they brought the apples that they were familiar with, but very few of them were really well adapted to the new soils and climate of North America. Um, and, and that's because they were bred and selected in a different place, a different climate, a different location. And so knowing that apples are variable when they grow from seed, this was a chance to spread apple seeds across the North American continent, well, really across Ohio and Indiana for the most part, uh, and, and allow sort of nature to decide where are the good apples and let people decide where are the good apples. And it turns out what he did was he went to cider mills on the rivers of Pennsylvania, probably near Pittsburgh, and he would collect the pumice, which is the pressed remains of, of when you make apple cider. And he would pick through that and pick the seeds and fill them full of gunny sacks and put them in a canoe or an outrigger canoe or a raft and float down the Ohio River to maybe 10 or 15, 20 miles beyond where the most recent settlers had settled. And he would legally lay claim to a patch of land and he would clear it and plant his apple seeds as an orchard. And then when those trees were big enough, westward expansion had continued where people were moving into that area. And one of the requirements, the federal requirements for land grants was to avoid speculation. I'm gonna get some land, let it increase, and I'm gonna sell it and move on. People had to plant at least 50 apple and pear trees and maybe 20 peach trees as well. And the idea was this is putting an investment, a commitment on the land, and you're not likely to just plant that and move on. And so when settlers came out, they had to have a source of apple trees. And even though there were nurseries available nearby that sold grafted trees, they knew about grafting at the time, Johnny Appleseed would sell these, uh, John Chapman would sell these orchard trees or these uh, seedling trees. So probably one of those trees or maybe one of its descendants was the source of the red delicious apple that's now in, in much disfavor. And probably other varieties of apples as, as well that have been selected in the Midwest. So interesting, interesting story. And if you're interested in that, uh, the, uh, one of the sources that, that I'll show you at the end is Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire. And a whole quarter of that book is on apples and, and focuses pretty heavily on Johnny Appleseed. It's also a great PBS two-part miniseries. Henry David Thoreau, he was familiar with wild apples up in the woods of Massachusetts and New England. And so these are two quotes from an essay that he wrote on wild apples. Sour enough to set a squirrel's teeth on edge and to make a jay scream. And then I love this second quote. There's a wild apple on Nashatucked Hill in my town, which is, has to me a peculiarly pleasant bitter tang not perceived till it's three quarters eaten. It remains on the tongue. As you eat it, it smells exactly like a squash bug. It's sort of a triumph to eat and relish it. Don't you love that? Like go through, yeah, go through. All right, so that's wild apples. Kazakhstan forests and uh, Johnny Appleseed and the wild apple trees in, in New England and, uh, and the central mid, mid, the Midwest. Uh, this is the pedigree of one of the trees that I have growing in my backyard called Enterprise. And there are a number of apple varieties that have been bred in the United States with the letters PRI and sequence in them. Um, most of them maybe you're not familiar with. Uh, there's Prima and Priscilla, Enterprise, um, Williams Pride, and the PRI stands for Purdue Rutgers in Illinois. And this was a three institution breeding project that started work back in the 1940s trying to breed in resistance to one of the key pests of apples in the Eastern United States. And that's a fungal disease called apple scab. And it turns out that Malus floribunda, which is a flowering crab tree that produces small, inedible, bitter fruit, is resistant to this apple scab fungus. Um, if you grow scab susceptible varieties of apples in the eastern United States where it's humid and it rains frequently, um, you may need to spray fungicide on those trees every week through the entire growing season from the time the petals drop off until harvest. Because it can, in a wet year, it can completely defoliate the tree the scab fungus attacks the leaves, and it also produces lesions, scab-like unsightly lesions on the surface of the fruit and makes consumers not want to buy those apples. 
So, um, so in a nod towards environmental friendliness and maybe um, helping support growers that wanted to use fewer chemicals, they started this breeding project. And you can see on the right-hand side, 1945 is when they did the very first crosses to try to breed this particular apple. Um, and they crossed that Malus floribunda with Rome Beauty, which is named for Rome, New York. Any of you ever had Rome Beauty apples? I grew up in Pennsylvania, and, and they were for sale there. They're not especially delicious, but they are beautiful, and they're a great baking apple. Big, round orbs of just deep, deep scarlet. Um, but and why they started with that one, I don't know, but, but they did. And then you can see that they did another cross and then another cross, and Golden Delicious is in there on both lines. Starking Delicious is the Red Delicious variety. It's one of those selections of the Red Delicious apple. Um, and then Macintosh comes in there on both lines. And then ultimately, and you can see these PRIs, that Purdue Rutgers, Illinois cross. And finally, in 1978, they did the final cross that resulted in the seedling that initially they, it just had a number. And of all of the apples that were produced from that cross, or all of the, all of the apples produced from that cross, uh, they planted out the seeds and they tasted the apples. They looked at the, the quality of the fruit and how the tree grew. And one by one, they chopped out those trees. Of course, at each stage, the very first thing they did, since the goal was to get resistance to the fungus in it, was while those trees were still seedlings in a greenhouse, they would expose them to the fungus. And if the fungus killed them, then the resistance gene was not there and they could eliminate those. They would just keep the ones that survived and then the goal was to get a high quality eating apple out of that. So 1978 was when that Co-op 30 was, was first produced. Uh, they said, this is a pretty good apple. So they would propagate it by grafting. And I'll show you that in, in a couple of minutes. And so that they had a whole bunch of these uh, Co-op 30 apples. They released them to growers in different parts of the country so that they could evaluate how well they grew and yielded in different parts of the country. And eventually enough positive feedback came back that they named it Enterprise and released it on the market so that nurseries could begin to propagate it and sell it. Um, so how long is that? 33 years from the first cross until the tree is on uh, into grower trials and then even longer until it's commercially available. So you gotta have a, a long view if you're breeding apples intentionally. Uh, this is one that's probably more familiar, Honeycrisp apple, many people's new favorite apple. Um, and you can see Golden Delicious is a parent here as well. And it turns out that Golden Delicious is in the parentage of many, many new apple varieties. It's often used as a pollen donor uh, in new, new varieties. Um, this is bred in, in Minnesota. Um, I couldn't find any information on when that Duchess of Oldenburg and Golden Delicious cross was done at the University of Minnesota. I couldn't find that out. But the, the result of that cross, the Minnesota 1627, was crossed with Keepsake Apple, which was another Minnesota-bred, commercially released variety of apple. That cross was done in 1960. How far back does your memory of Honeycrisp go? 1960? No. 1970? No, 1980? No. First Honeycrisp apples made it on the market in 1997. And interestingly, uh, the growers thought this was a good apple. The breeders thought it was a good apple. Uh, they tried to get growers to grow it, but apple growers are very conservative because it takes a long time from when you plant an orchard until you get fruit. And all that time, you're putting money in, but you're not getting money out. And so this Honeycrisp apple, they almost trashed it because growers weren't picking up on it. And finally, a new breeder came on as a young graduate, or a, a new, uh, new researcher in the Minnesota Breeding Program and gave it one more taste. He said, this is a really good apple, and he got a grower to grow it, and, and the market has grown ever since. Um, part of the problem with Honeycrisp, from the grower's perspective, is that if you go to the store, and I was actually at Coleman's IGA recently uh, picking up something else, and I just out of curiosity thinking about this talk, I looked at the apples, and you could pay uh, like $2.19 for Honeycrisp apples per pound, or you could pay, buy Red Delicious for $1.19, right? Almost a dollar difference. So that's going to reflect back to the orchardists. And apples have such a thin margin, especially in the days of global marketing and trade, that orchardists have to be in tune with the most recent development. They want to grow the highest value apple possible, 
but there's a time lag, right? It's not like growing carrots where you can till up the field and put in the newest, latest, greatest carrot seed, right? You got to put in a whole bunch of trees. You got to weed them, spray them, irrigate them, and nowadays stake them, fence them to protect them from deer. And then only gradually after a number of years will they start to produce, and it might take another couple of years until they're in full production. And so you want to maximize that yield. If people start growing, if everyone jumps on the Honeycrisp bandwagon, then supply and demand, the prices are going to drop. And Honeycrisp apples turn out to be a really difficult apple to grow well. And probably many of you who like Honeycrisp apples, if you pay attention, you'll say, wow, that one was really good. That's much better than the ones that I had last year. Or the ones that I bought at this store taste much better than the ones I bought at that store. And, and that, in large part, has to do with the growing of those apples and how they were kept after they were harvested. So uh, jumping on the Honeycrisp bandwagon is pr really profitable for the early adopters, but then after that, less and less so. And especially if the quality of that apple begins to decline because people are growing it outside of places where it grows particularly well. And it does grow well in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Not so well in the drier western United States, like Oregon and Washington, and maybe overseas. So, um, and that reflects where it was bred. It varies, but almost all commercial apple production is on dwarfing rootstocks now. Molly and mm, that's going to depend on the orchard. Yeah, yeah right. So uh, again, going back to that idea of sex and genetic variability, this is a recent study. It turns out that when Honeycrisp came on the market, the Minnesota apple breeding program did not know what the parents were. They had a guess. Like, really? That's not a very well-organized breeding program. How could you breed an apple and not know who the parents are? So it, it turns out it was a new graduate student that came in and used modern genetic techniques. And this is what's called a chromosome map. And it looks really complicated. All the little dash, all the little horizontal black lines are different genes. Each of the colored bars is one of its chromosomes. And the, the main thing I want you to take away from it is the colors. Each of the colors represents genetic material from one of its different parents. So the, shuffling the deck, right? That genetic variability. This was just one particular arrangement of those chromosomes and the shuffling of the content within those chromosomes that happened in that cross between the Minnesota 1627 and Keepsake. So there's frostbite in there, there's Nor Northern Spy in there, there's Duchess of Oldenburg and Golden Delicious in there. So again, sex creates that genetic variability. This is a figure I found from Popular Science, which was really interesting. Uh, that big circle in the middle is all of that genetic variability of Malus domestica or Malus pomola, right? The gene pool of apples. And then pulling out of those are certain varieties that were either bred or selected. So you can see Golden Delicious there was a bred apple. And look at the number of lines coming out of Golden Delicious there. Down to Enterprise, that was the one that I have growing in my, one in my backyard. John of Gold, it turns out that Golden Delicious was one of the parents of, uh, of MM1627 that goes into Honeycrisp. So Honeycrisp has uh, Golden Delicious breeding in it. Um, Red Delicious over there, and you can see the Red Delicious too, and the Starkings. So those are, uh, those are selections from there. The Granny Smith was a wild apple tree. You can see the crab apple feeding into that up there in the top. Um, and then this cosmic crisp down here in the bottom right, remember that one. That's one that is on the market for the very first time this past fall. I haven't actually tried it yet or seen it. Has anyone had cosmic crisp apples? They had a special on CBS about that. Um, they were just talking about that they're really planting a lot of that. Apples. Yeah, and I'll show you some pictures. University of Washington. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Yep, and so my enterprise down there is one of the parents of Cosmic Crisp along with Honey Crisp. All right, uh, so one of the things, one of the big advances, right, so that uh, enterprise apple that took 33 years to get to the first seedling and then more grower trials and nursery production until it was on the market. Um, you've probably all heard of the Human Genome Project, the sequencing of all of the DNA in human cells. Uh, the apple genome, complete genome, was sequenced for the first time in 2017, and this promises to really speed up apple growing and really create us much more uh, ability to have apples with desirable qualities in a much shorter time. Um, and so this is kind of a complicated figure. The left-hand side 
is traditional plant breeding the way that I've talked about so far. And you can see five to seven years per cycle. Why? Because you plant a seed and then you get a seedling and you got to grow it in the greenhouse and then you got to put it out in the field and you got to let it grow and then eventually it's going to mature and produce some fruit and fruit that you can evaluate the quality of. And what the genome sequencing allows us to do is identify what genes might be associated with desirable characteristics of storage or flavor or uh, insect resistance or adaptation to cold, and they can screen the seedlings for possession of that genetic material. They don't have to actually grow the tree up. And so they can uh, cut, cut that timing down considerably by using that genetic sequence. So in the same way that the Human Genome Project should theoretically improve healthcare by allowing us to target interventions specifically to your genetics, the same kind of benefit will come true in apple breeding as well, speeding it up by using that genetic information. So are they taking the seed to get the, the genome out of that? Or uh, no, they would, they would germinate the seed because if they take the genetic information out of the seed, they would have damaged the seed and then they wouldn't be able to grow that. Yeah. So, so they would, they would germinate the seeds and then take, take a leaf sample from the greenhouse when it's just a little seedling and not, not even out in the field yet, right? Because they, they can get a, the DNA information that they need from, you know, probably a, less than a square centimeter of leaf tissue. So then if the tree turns out to be good, they can keep it growing and they haven't really harmed it. All right. So two origins of domestic fruit are those wild trees and just finding by luck. Huh, here's a nice one, or intentional breeding. The third way is what are called sports. I love that name. Sport, you're sporting a new tie, right? And, and it's kind of that thing. But the way that plants grow is a region of cell division at the tip of every stem. That's the place where those trees are growing new leaves and new branches and new buds and new fruit. And if a mutation happens in one of those growth tips, then all of the cells produced by that newly mutated cell will carry that new genetic information. And so that's how it's possible to have a red delicious tree with sort of reddish apples and then have a branch with really, really red apples. The mutation happened and then all of that branch and any of the material taken from that branch is carrying that new genetic material. And so it turns out that uh, perhaps the decline of red delicious is Eating quality is due to an unintentional selection for appearance, but those are all sports, mutations that happen that change the color but also change the flavor profile. Um, and interestingly, I found this statistic that maybe as much as 30% of named apple varieties have originated as that kind of mutation on a branch, just a random genetic mutation that's happened. That's pretty amazing, and that, that those would uh, account for up to half of global apple production. Wow. You think, oh, we're smart people. We know genetics. We'll do breeding. Eh, it's just like random genetic accidents that have led to this. Um, the other thing that's interesting is if you're a gardener and you get seed catalogs that have apple trees or other fruit trees in them, you may have noticed uh, the advent of these columnar apple trees where the trees just go straight up and you can plant them really close together and they don't really spread out very much. That's a mutation in a rootstock, and the rootstock uh, controls the form of that tree, and that also was originated as a sport. So they found this branch that was like growing vertically and just had little tiny side branches of fruiting spurs on it. They said that's, uh, so that's kind of interesting as well. So regardless of how we get those good apples, there's gonna be one branch or one seedling wild seedling or one bread seedling that has fruit that we want in order to get an orchard full of them or a country full of them or a countryside full of them we have to do grafting and grafting is that technique that johnny appleseed objected to but uh but it's really fun to do and i've i've got one apple tree in my backyard that has uh, it's bearing four varieties of apples on it because I've done graphs like uh, this one on the bottom left where I just lop off a big limb and I take a little pencil-sized piece of an apple that I don't have yet that I'm interested in and I get those growth layers to line up, the cambium layers to line up. And uh, if I do it correctly and I'm successful, that little pencil-sized twig with the genetics of the kind of fruit that I want will merge with the growth layer of that existing apple tree and then everything that grows from that little pencil-sized piece uh, will give me the kind of fruit that I want. 
Um, orchardists would probably do a technique more like the one at the top or actually depend on a nursery that has done this. So they'll take the kind of apple they want and graft it onto a root stock, which is a genetically different apple that can help um, determine a whole variety of characteristics. So if you have that seedling, that very first Honeycrisp seedling that's nice, you like its fruit, you cut off a little pencil-sized piece and you can stick it either on an existing tree or on the root, uh, the, the, the stem of an existing apple tree or a seedling or a cutting, um, you can do a cleft graft. So there's a lot of different types of grafting, but that's where all of our commercial apples come from. And the same is true for peaches and for plums and for cherries and probably grapes. Almost all of those are propagated by grafting at the commercial level. So, um, so what you can see here is rootstocks. Um, I, I grow apples that have sort of a semi-dwarf rootstock. And so what that means is there was probably some mutations in an apple tree that made the root system not quite so vigorous, not so widespreading, not so able to absorb nutrients and moisture. And so the above ground part of the tree was sort of keeping up with that and was smaller. If you take a Honeycrisp apple stick and you graft it onto one of those root systems that's kind of sort of half-assed, right? Not super vigorous, you're gonna get a medium-sized tree. If you take a cutting of Honeycrisp and you stick it on one of those columnar root stocks, you're gonna get a columnar style of Honeycrisp apple tree. Um, and so, these rootstocks are controlling the size of the tree, but they can also help adapt the tree to certain diseases, uh, to certain soil types like heavy clay or sand, um, to certain overwintering uh, wintering tolerance. So the rootstock can influence a lot of characteristics of the tree as a whole, its overall shape, but uh, the part that you graft on is what influences the, the fruiting characteristic. So rootstocks are kind of cool. This just gives you a sense. This is what would uh, an old timey apple orchard would look like. These are called seedling rootstocks. So you could take any old apples that you had. You could plant all of those seeds, grow them up. It doesn't matter what kind of fruit they have because you're gonna lop that whole top off and then stick on the, the, the scion wood, the fruiting wood of the kind you want. And then those trees are gonna grow into full size trees that fruit the way that you want them to. The problem with this from an orchard perspective is uh, it can be hard to spray the whole tree. You gotta use ladders to harvest the fruit off the whole tree. Pruning the tree to maintain its shape takes a lot of labor uh, and ladders and labor costs are very expensive. This is what most modern orchards look like. They're called high density plantings and these trees might never get more than eight or 10 feet tall. They're on root systems that are uh, really not very vigorous at all. And so the trees have to be staked up with either wires or trellises. Um, it's a much more expensive way of planting apples, but because these trees are only gonna get eight feet tall, they're gonna start bearing fruit and come into full maturity and full bearing much more quickly. So it uh, reduces your investment, maybe more upfront investment in trellising, but then you begin to harvest uh, a profit from those trees much sooner. And these dwarfing and semi-dwarf rootstocks can be helpful for people that are interested in a variety of fruit in a small urban or suburban backyard because you can plant the trees much closer together. Uh, one other thing about apples that's interesting is they, they have the characteristic that they continue to ripen after harvest. And it's hard to see in apples because red skin doesn't really change all that much, right? Um, but you can see it pretty nicely in these Bartlett pears and in bananas, um, mangoes, cantaloupes, a variety of fruit have this characteristic. Tomatoes as well, right? You pick a green tomato that's full size and you put it on your, on your countertop and it turns red. And that ripening process has to do with temperature. The warmer it is, the faster that's gonna happen. Uh, it has to do with cellular respiration. So this apple, is one of my Liberty apples that I harvested back in October. And I've had it in a little dorm refrigerator in my basement um, ever since then. And it's kind of shriveled up. It's not real squishy yet, but it's softer than it was when I, when I picked it. Um, so cellular respiration is happening. It's making ethylene gas, which is a ripening and senescence kind of mortality uh, plant hormone. Um, and in fact, if you have apples and you put them near cabbage or potatoes or bananas or other things, 
they'll speed up the maturity and the browning. If you put it next to cut flowers, the cut flowers, the petals will turn brown and drop off faster. So all of that is related to this uh, hormone called ethylene. And that production is based on temperature and cellular respiration, meaning the same thing that we do. You breathe in oxygen and you take food and you burn through that in your cells and get the energy that you need to do the, the, the actions of life. Um, the amylase is a starch breaking down enzyme. So think about the difference in taste between a green banana and a ripe banana, right? The green one is really starchy and the ripe banana is sweet. And that's because amylase is the enzyme that converts starch into sugar. And the same thing happens in apples that are ripening in pears. And pectinase, pectin is the glue that holds plant cells together. And if you loosen that glue, you wind up with a softer fruit. So think about the difference between a red ripe tomato and a green tomato. That's the action of pectinase. So what, what do you like in an apple? We want it to be sweet and we want it to be crisp. And the longer you store an apple, the longer these things happen and the squishier the apple gets. This one's already a little bit shriveled, but. So what options do we have? If we want fresh, crisp apples year round, July, October, December, March, what are we gonna do? We got four options. One of them is cold storage, and this has been known for a long time. So commercial orchards will have huge, big refrigerated storages and bins of apples would go in there and they'd drop the temperature down to 32 to 34, 36 degrees Fahrenheit and keep the apples and they could bring them out. That's enough to slow down respiration and ethylene and those ripening actions, but it's not enough to stop it. So they discovered controlled atmosphere storage. And this is kind of like putting the apples into suspended animation. What they do is the same kind of thing. It's a refrigerated big storage, but they have the ability to purge all of the atmosphere out of that room, get all of the oxygen out, which stops the cellular respiration, and they replace it with 100% nitrogen, which already makes up 78% of our atmosphere, so it's not anything foreign. And in some cases, they increase the carbon dioxide level a little bit. And in that case, you could pick an apple in October, stick it into a controlled atmosphere storage, and pull it out the next October, and it would be almost identical to when you put it in, if the storage was good. Obviously, for growers, that's a big expense. So um, you have to be a large grower in order to do that. Uh, the third option, bring them in from the Southern Hemisphere, because when it's our spring, it's their fall, We've got nasty shriveled apples from a refrigerated storage and they're harvesting fresh ones. So throw them on a boat in a refrigerator and ship them across. And so a lot of our apples come from New Zealand or Chile or Argentina, Southern hemisphere. Uh, and then the fourth option is to breed apples that don't soften. So if we can find apples where that pectinase gene is not active, then we'll have apples that are crisp permanently until they go bad. So cultivated apples, Thoreau we talked about earlier, Here's his quote on cultivated apples, the ones that he could find at the store or at nurseries. Apples for grafting appear to have been selected commonly, not so much for their spirited flavor, like stink bugs or squash bugs, um, as for their mildness, their size, and their bearing qualities. And we might add to that skin color. Not so much for their beauty as for their fairness and soundness. Indeed, I have no faith in the selected lists of pomological gentlemen, meaning apple growers and apple breeders. Their favorites and none suches and seek no furthers when I have fruited them commonly turn out very tame and forgettable. They're eaten with comparatively little zest, have no real tang or smack to them. Oh, Thoreau, love the guy, right? And Frank Browning is, uh, is an interesting guy. He was an orchardist from Kentucky. Uh, and he wrote a book that I really love, and I have that one here too, it's just called Apples. Um, and it covers a bit of the Kazakhstan, a bit of Geneva, and a bit of the history and the mythology of apples. Um, the emergence of a global trade in apples as in other commodities has skewed the search for new varieties to a very few limited criteria. Hard, pretty fruit that hold their Christmas for a week at room temperature. Flavor in there? Mm, no. Deliciousness? No. Resistance to diseases or insects that require fewer pesticides? No. Uh, and then he continues, these commodity-driven criteria have impoverished the entire American food supply and have produced ordinary, uninteresting apples that simply can't compete with our modern junk foods. An apple a day, even if it doesn't taste good, right? All right, so there are some recent improvements in apple breeding, and, and Honeycrisp is one of those. Um, what the Minnesota breeders did was they patented the apple with the U.S. Patent Office. Patents have a limited lifespan. 
when they run out, it protects your economic interest in that, in that material for the length of the patent. When the patent runs out, you can't renew it and anybody can do anything with it. So if you're an orchardist and you're growing Honeycrisp apples, um, if you're the Minnesota breeding program and you're harvesting royalties from every Honeycrisp apple tree that's sold by a nursery, uh, when that patent runs out, you're out of luck, right? The economic advantage of that is done. Um, and, and because Honeycrisp can be grown by anybody, anywhere, maybe even unskilled growers that don't really know how to grow that apple perfectly well, the quality of Honeycrisp goes down. And then even if you're a good grower of Honeycrisp, creating the most delicious Honeycrisp apples anywhere, uh, the quality of that brand has been reduced because of the, the Yahoo's, they're growing it not very well. Um, so the new development, and uh, this has arisen since Honeycrisp came on the market and was commercialized and started to suffer some of those declines, is what are called club apples. And this is a trademark. Trademarks last forever as long as you keep renewing them. And so what happens with club apples is that the breeders of that apple allow only a limited number of licensed growers to grow that apple. And those apples are subject to quality standards. And that does two things for the growers. It costs them money to get into the club, but then their investment in that new apple is protected from overproduction and from declining quality from people that don't know what's going on. So Chris, if you could pull up that first website. Uh, oh, the other one, yep. So uh, I'm just gonna have him scroll through. This is uh, from the NPR, um, NPR blog. Some of these apples you may recognize from the supermarket. These are newly bred apple varieties. Cosmic Crisp was one that I mentioned earlier. Evercrisp is an interesting one. There's a Midwest Apple Improvement Association that was started using, uh, their goal initially was to try to breed in some of that genetic material from Kazakhstan through the Geneva Breeding Project uh, into apples but they've resorted to just crossing existing apples, and Evercrisp is one of those. Um, so when you, if you browse through this, you can see that who can grow it is one of the listings, and all of those have a restricted list of who can actually grow the apples. In some cases, it's geographic in nature based on where the breeding was. In some cases, it's just sort of a membership in the club, and a certain number of people get in, and, and they can grow those. So um, Snapdragon from New York. Uh, pinata I've seen at the store. So, um, so all of those are crisp, delicious, quality controlled apples based on the being a member in the club. So back to the PowerPoint, Chris, or maybe to the other website. Yep. Uh, and so Cosmic Crisp is this new apple that was just on the market this year. And this also from the NPR blog shows what happens when a new really exciting apple comes on the scene. Orchardists will tear out their old orchards and replant with the new stuff. And you can imagine how expensive this is. So that's the breeder of, uh, of Cosmic Crisp. Every single tree in that high density orchard will be Cosmic Crisp. So these Washington growers are investing an incredible amount of money in that orchard. Um, and that's what the nurseries would look like. Those are all of those grafted Cosmic Crisp apples in a nursery in cold storage awaiting planting in the springtime. Uh, I, I don't know enough about it. It's, it's, it's new to me. And uh, I don't think, and I don't think I'd even, I don't think any of us would even be able to get our hands on one of those trees because, um, because of the, the, the trademark. Probably the best you could do is go out to Washington, sneak into an orchard in the middle of the night and take yourself some cyan wood uh, and then graft your own tree and then test it out. So, yep. Okay, so on to my last topic. Oh, and I apologize. Oh no, I'm actually right on time and I'm almost done. Um, so, whoops, Ooh, back up. So cider and juice, this is always an issue of concern. Which one do you think is the cider? The one on the left, right? We all know cider is sort of the brown, unfiltered apple juice. The stuff on the right is purified, filtered, and, whoops, wrong button. But it turns out that the United States has no regulations on names like cider and juice. And in fact, the one on the left is banking on the familiarity with Honeycrisp, Honeycrisp juice, not from concentrate. And then the Kroger one on the right says apple cider from concentrate. Wow, 
So you could get cider from that frozen can of concentrate in the freezer compartment, and you could get unfiltered apple juice. Most of the world, cider refers to the fermented apple beverage, where you press the apple juice and you let it ferment to become an alcoholic beverage with a uh, alcohol content like five, six percent. Um, but in the United States, juice and cider are kind of used interchangeably. Most of us would think of the one on the left as cider. Um, so uh, this may seem a little bit irrelevant, but um, one of the quotes from Frank Browning's book, Apples, uh, he talks about, um, he, he talks to a, a, a vineyard owner, a, a winemaker in Sonoma County who produces very high quality wines, and the Gallo Brothers' big commercial winery was having some troubles, economic troubles and sales troubles as people were paying more attention to higher quality wines and things. And this uh, winemaker says, listen, Sonny, the Gallows made it possible for winemakers like me to do business. The Gallows are the ones who introduced wine to middle class Americans. If some of them move on to smaller producers like me, it's because they first learned about wine from people like Gallo Brothers. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for them. And so when I read that quote, I kind of thought about cappuccino, like out of a hot chocolate machine. I lived in Spain for nine months. Like, you know, you got to grind the beans and put it under pressure and extract it. Like, you need a barista, right? You have to steam the milk. So I, I found this old picture on Quick Trip's Twitter feed. Like, <laughs> really? Can you get cappuccino at a push of a button from a machine and it tastes like syrup with artificial flavoring? <laughs> right? Well, it turns out that that's what has happened to cider in America. Cider was, for a long time, the drink of choice, maybe of necessity. Water was contaminated. Everybody had those apple trees on their property. They could press them. They could ferment them. Cider was safer to drink than contaminated water. Um, in Europe, same thing was true in Spain and Italy, and, and especially in the UK. Uh, so if you go to the store, you go to Triggs, you go to County Market, and you look in the, in the liquor department, the beer department, in the refrigerated compartments, you can find hard ciders. But most of them are like Cider Boys that's made by Point Brewery down in Stevens Point. Like, wow, I didn't know cider came in all those different flavors and colors. Um, I got curious leading up to this. So before Christmas, I went out and I bought myself a four pack of Stellar Artois Cidre because it sounded European and authentic. And then I got home and I cracked one open and I tasted it and I'm like, no. And then I actually read the label and what you can see on that label is it's made with apple juice concentrate and sucrose and flavors. Like, mm, it tasted kind of like an apple wine cooler. Wasn't what I was interested in. And it didn't taste anything like the apple cider that I make at home, uh, the hard cider that I make. Um, but there is good commercial cider available. I've seen some for sale at Downtown Grocery, for example. Um, and I was really excited to find this first Wisconsin cider pub down in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. So I'm gonna have to plan a road trip to go down there. Bricks Cider, um, I actually attended an apple cider, apple variety grafting workshop with the owners of that, uh, of that pub. Um, and they've got a really interesting blog, so uh, you might check out Bricks Cider. Um, UW-Madison has gotten into this, um, so they just published a, a document looking at uh, sensory characteristics of apple varieties that grow in Wisconsin, including some traditional European apple variety, apple cider variety, apples. And you can see here, it's not going to be as complicated as, as wine, right? Or, oh, I taste pomegranate with a little bit of cocoa, and, right? <laughs> Um, but you can see that uh, they were evaluating mouthfeel and appearance, astringency, intensity, bitterness, um, acidity, sweetness, uh, all of these different kinds of things. So this is just a graph to kind of show you that well-prepared cider can be a really interesting drink. Um, and I'll close with this one. Um, traditionally, apples grown in Europe would have been, especially in England and in the UK, would have been spitters the kind that Thoreau would have been excited about that tastes like squash bugs and uh, putting the squirrel's teeth on edge. Um, there was a traditional, perhaps of pagan origin, tradition of wassailing the apple trees, usually on January 4th. And uh, people would get a little liquored up on cider, have some torches, soak a piece of toast, I don't know why, 
in cider and hang it on the apple tree. They would dump cider on the ground. Probably that started because they had too much cider to begin with. But the whole idea was uh, they would sing a chant to the tree. Here's to the old apple tree that blooms well, bears well, hats full, cups full, three bushel bags full, all under one tree. Huzzah, huzzah. Uh, and this is an advertisement from a uh, Virginia orchard that just had their wassailing ceremony three days ago. Uh, this is a picture um, from uh, ancient times, ancient for me. So there, there are some sources for you. I'll leave this up if you're interested. The ones that I marked with arrows are ones that might be particularly readable and interesting if you're interested in finding some more. Uh, Barry Juniper, Juniper Berry. It's hard to take a, a British guy seriously with that name of Juniper Berry. It's actually Barry Juniper. Um, but he is a retired professor at, I think, at Oxford University. And um, this, that first article, it's a very readable article that talks a lot about the forests of Kazakhstan and the roles of bears and camels and the, and the trade caravans and things. Uh, the story of the apple, the next one, is, is a bit technical. Um, and they were criticized for that. So they've got a new book coming out. Maverly and Juniper have a new book coming out next year that uh, I'm, I'm assuming will be sort of a, a dumbed down version that would be a little bit more readable. Frank Browning's book, Apples, is wonderful. Very interesting to read. Um, and then Michael Pollan's Botany of Desires, both the book and the PBS miniseries are really interesting. Uh, and a quarter of that Botany of Desire book is about Johnny Appleseed and apples. Um, and then if you're interested in apple varieties, the Orange Pippin website is fantastic as well. Safe travels home, and I hope you enjoyed the session.